welcome to the Business Credit and Financing Show. Each week, we talk about the growth strategies that matter most to entrepreneurs. Listen in as we discuss the secrets to getting credit and money to start and grow your business. And enjoy as we talk with seasoned business owners, coaches, and industry leaders on a variety of topics from advertising and marketing to the nuts and bolts of running a highly successful business. And now, to introduce the host of our show, financial expert and award-winning author, Ty Crandall. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show today. So today's going to be an awesome day. We have a really cool guest with us. He knows a lot about a lot of different kind of topics and has been able to come from where a lot of you are, which I think is you know struggling in the beginning stages of a business to growing a business so successfully that now he mentors other business owners. So with us today is Chris Cooper. Now, Chris is the founder of the largest mentoring practice in the fitness world with clients on every continent. He actually started his entrepreneurial life as a gym owner, and in 2005, Chris had a new home, wife, and baby. His job as a personal trainer wouldn't cover the bills, so he opened a business, or so he thought. Three years in, he realized he didn't have a business, but had just bought himself a high-risk job with no upside. When he missed a pay period, he hit bottom and realized he needed help. He found a mentor and paid for the service with a check that he really thought maybe even could have bounced. Over the next two years, he was taught to how to build a real business. He began mentoring gym owners in 2013 and founded his own practice, Two Brain Business, in 2016. It rapidly grew to become the largest fitness mentorship practice in the world with over 350 gyms participating worldwide. Now, in 2017, Chris opened the Two Brain Workshop to help entrepreneurs in his city. He immediately attracted the attention of many local business owners who wanted to grow their service business. And his last two books, Two Brain Business 2.0 and Help First, are applicable to any service and has helped many local clients, including including spa owners, accountants, HR managers, administrators, and attorneys. And now he operates local seminars and trains mentors around the Two Brain umbrella. So, Chris, thanks for coming in today. Thanks, Ty. Thanks for the amazing intro. Yeah, man. I'm excited you could be here. Well, it's hard not to have an amazing intro with your amazing past. (laughs) (laughs) So It's been a roller coaster. Yeah, it sounds like it. You started as a personal trainer. And then yeah. you jumped in and thought, hey, like a lot of people do, I, I'm doing this. I could probably run a business doing that. What were some of the initial surprises that you kind of uncovered the difference between you know, being a personal trainer and actually running a business doing that? Well, I think I made the same mistake that a lot of business owners do, and that's believing that if you're the best in your field at a certain service, that you're naturally going to own the best business around that service. And uh, what I didn't understand was that I couldn't be – a good personal trainer anymore. I had to become a good business owner. And that was probably a huge surprise that took about three years to sink in. Well, nice. And, and I think I see that a lot in the restaurants, right? You have a great sure. chef. You know, they think they can run a business. But like you said, there's a big difference between the two of being great at what you do and, and running the business doing what you do. Yeah, it's really common. And some of the first mentors that I had were mechanics and, um, you know, lumber mill owners who. They thought that they were especially good at their craft, and then it took them 20 years to really get their business going, and I was pretty fortunate to be around them. And then found a local business mentor who had been part of some massive turnarounds in the paper industry and decided he was going to leave his legacy in in our city by mentoring five different business owners, and I just kind of snuck in there. Nice. That's awesome. And so are you still with him now? Nope. But he's been to my gym. So uh, we kind of turned the tables there a little bit. He's retired. He was planning to leave town. It was one of those kind of Lee Iacocca deals where his first year he accepted shares of stock and a $1 salary. And I think the stock price went from, you know, 70 cents to about $54 after about five years. So he was just done. But he wasn't, you know, seeing uh, any closure in town. And he thought this would kind of be his last gift to the community. And I was lucky enough to be one of those five. And now I kind of having been at the bottom, I, I understand the responsibility that a business mentor has to make sure that the clients can get to where I got to. Well, how, how important do you think having a mentor is to running a business? Well, it's always been critical for me. And it's not because I, I don't have enough ideas. It's usually because I have too many ideas or I'm having trouble focusing on one thing. The more successful you get, and I'm, I'm sure you know this too, Ty, the more opportunities kind of land on your plate. And it's really hard to say no. 
So you wind up saying yes to everything and then never really accomplishing anything. And, and so what my mentor does for me is just make sure that I'm focused on the most important thing right now. And also just kind of streamlines the process for me and introduces me usually to the people who are going to help me reach the next level. Now, after you found your initial mentor, that it really seems like made the change. I mean, as I was kind of introducing you, that's kind of where you made the shift. It went from, I don't know what's going on, and this might not work, all the way to being really successful. What, 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 you, did you switch then? So the mentor that you have no longer does that. And then how did you go about finding a second one? Well, yeah, so the, the first mentor that I had got me to stability. And it, he got me to having a consistently run business that would take care of itself. And what that did was created a platform for opportunity. So, you know, I worked with Dennis for a couple of years. He left town and then I just worked my tail off again for four or five years until I found Dan Martell. And Dan was speaking at uh, the Archangel Summit in Toronto, Canada. I was in the audience and his CrossFit coach texted him and said, hey, the CrossFit guy is there. You should meet him. And so Dan started texting my phone and saying, hey, come back, meet Gary Vaynerchuk, meet Seth Godin. And of course, my phone was dead. And so I didn't get the message for several hours until I was already in the airport leaving the city. And uh, anyway, this kind of serendipity happens to me a lot uh, in my life. And, and that's when he became my mentor for the last year and helped me take Two Brain from popular in the US to a major international brand. So now, what do you guys do over there at Two Brain? We're a mentoring practice, so we try to match business owners with the best possible mentor for them. So I've been extremely lucky in finding the right mentor at the right time, but that's a lot like winning a lottery. And so what we try to do is match the best mentor with the highest affinity and the right balance of you know empathy and, and accountability with our trainees. And then what we do is we put them through different periods. The first is called incubation where the mentor and the trainee are working very closely one-on-one. -on -one. They're maintaining focus on one small task at a time and then backing that up with daily homework assignments. So we have an online platform where you know the gym owner or the other entrepreneur would go on, know what their homework is for that day, watch a video module of me or another mentor, and then fill out a template to finish their homework. And then it, it goes on from there. But that's, that's the first stage. And that's the relationship that we try to provide people. So now, do you mentor in all industries? All service industries. On the product side, I don't do a lot. But on the service industry, we find that people who are providing a service to the public have a lot of commonalities, a lot of overlap. So for example, you know, in the workshop today, there was a small engine mechanic. He's struggling because he isn't sure if he should hire some staff to order parts so that he can sell parts. There's a, a chef who opened up her cafe right in the workshop, and she's struggling to get somebody to come in and repair her stove, but she isn't sure if she should shut down for the day to, to get this work done. You know, So all different types of services. Yeah, all different kinds of services and all different kinds of problems they're trying to get solved. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen this before too. Every problem seems different through their lens, but really they've probably been solved in another field already, you know? Right. Well, and I think that's where, you know, personally for me, mentorship and coaches really are very good because like you said, it's about perspective. It's impossible sometimes to see things in your business through another perspective. And it's amazing at how mentors and coaches can come in and just make one, what's, what should really be a simple suggestion. And you're like, oh my gosh, like I, <laughs> I, never, I, never, even, yeah. I never even thought of that, right? So yeah, I think you're right. That, that shift in perspective is just invaluable. Yeah, I mean, some of our top senior mentors at Two Brain, they're they're very different people. You know, Jason Williams, he'll usually say something to me that's more in my face. You know, it sometimes it contradicts what I was thinking, and I usually get mad at him for about twenty four hours, and then I realize he's right and adopt exactly what he told me verbatim. <laughs> Another mentor, you know, like Ken Andruco, is completely empathetic. He'll listen to me talk for fifty five minutes and then say, "Hey, it sounds like your problem is this." And he's absolutely right, you know, and, you know, so it's really matching like who the best mentor is for the best person. Yeah. And you say that and I laugh because it's, 
I remember my COO and I used to be that way. I mean, we're two completely different people, and it's interesting now how much we feed off each other. But there in the beginning, it was like that. She would make suggestions, and I would just shut her down. And then I would think about it, and I'd come back and be like, yeah, that's that's a great idea. And so, <laughs> you know, exactly the same thing. And now I've learned just not to say no. I'm like, you know, that's a great thing. Well, me think, And then the more I think of that, the more I realize how great of an idea it is. And I think that makes sense. You know, another thing I've been looking into a lot is the visionary versus the implementer and how having somebody around you that's the opposite can really make an impact. So it sounds like that's kind of the strategy that, that you guys are using uh, over there at TwoBrain. Yeah, that's really where the TwoBrain name came from is the left hemisphere, you know, the analytical complements the right hemisphere, which is the empathetic. Sure. That makes perfect sense. And I yeah. think, you know, whether it be an implementer or a visionary or whatever you want to call it, I think that, that that makes really, really, really good sense because running a business with just half of the brain, per se, what you're saying, it really is difficult. But when you put the two together, that's when you can really can see all problems from two different angles. And it seems much easier with that kind of strategy to be able to solve even the biggest obstacles that you come across. Yeah, you know, and for me, it, I think it took me so long to find a mentor because my ego was in the way. You know, I think things a certain way, and dealing with someone who sees things differently, you know, it was a it was a huge ego confrontation for me. And so it, it took a huge brain like Dennis's to get me to accept that I really didn't know very much at all, uh, let alone everything. And we try to provide that perspective to people as tactfully as we can. Now, what are some of the things that you learned through this shift from, you know, struggling business owner all the way to, you know, making the business successful and now mentoring others on how to do the same? Well, I think that, first of all, the biggest surprise was that success doesn't make your problems go away. It just magnifies them. But if you can go through enough problems when you're small, you'll have clues later on on how to solve the bigger ones. So, for example, I learned early on that staff doesn't only care about money. They also care about what you care about. They care about having a vision and the ability to control their own destiny and, and have some continuing education. If I had to learn that lesson now, it would cost me millions of dollars in staff. But because I learned that when I was small, you know, it cost me $150,000 in mistakes instead. So I think that's been a great one for me is that all the early failures have really given me perspective that can help other people in their journey too. When you're, as you talk about team, I mean, what are the, some of the most effective ways you found to actually lead and mentor your own team? Well, so that's, that's a concept that we call mentoring your staff, as you said. And um, the first thing that we do every quarter is try to meet with them and say, what's your perfect day? You know, what do you want now? And we have them describe if everything is going perfect in their life, what time they get up in the morning, what time they come to work. Maybe they don't even come to work. What time they go home at night? You know, what else are they doing during that day? Are they going to work out? Are they, you know, taking a study break? Are they drinking one coffee or five? And we try to get them to paint the most robust picture we can. And then what we've done is we've placed the staff person at the center of the story, and that gives us the opportunity to be their guide. So the next step is to say, if that's your perfect day, here are the steps that I see to get there. Are you willing to work on these together? And so they have kind of this view of the horizon and that pulls us through a lot of smaller disagreements that used to trap me. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, one of the thing I've realized recently when it comes to staff is that, you know, what motivates me doesn't motivate them. So what, what do you think about that? I mean, like what kind of things do you do to incentivize your team? Well, I let them tell me what they want a lot because different staff people, they have changing needs, right? So for a long time, I had a staff guy. He was amazing. We started a big program together, and it, it went worldwide, and he was happy making a commission on that. And then he got married and had a baby and bought a house, and suddenly the bank needed to see you know, kind of a predictable income, and so he wanted to go on a salary. The commission structure just wasn't going to do it for him anymore. And then after about two years, when he felt secure, he said, I, I want to participate more on the upside. And then as his baby got older, he wanted to be at home more. And the, the key is that if I'm not asking my staff these questions, I'm never going to know the answer. And as you said, I am, I'm not good at guessing what that answer might be. I can't project what I want onto everyone else. So we do this with our staff in our gyms. We do this in the, with our staff in our mentoring clients. And we do it with our clients. We, we often ask them, what do you want now? 
Yeah, and I think it's a great way to go because that is a very, very, very – the first time you do it, it is a mind-blowing experience because, like I said, you, what you realize is that the things that you've thought about – that motivate you don't motivate your team. And sometimes it's much easier and cheaper to motivate them than what you ever thought it would be because they yeah. care about vacation days versus, you know, extra commissions or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, or they might just want me to stop texting them at 4 a.m. <laughs> well, you know, it's how dare it's so they? easy for us to, to project. I know. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? You're not awake? I'm awake. It's, it's so easy for us to project what we want on everyone around us. And, and the truth is that, you know, our spouses probably don't want exactly the same thing that we do. And my kids don't want to get up at 4 a.m. and go to work like I do. So it's really important for us to be asking everyone around us, what do you want now? You know, at least every quarter. Yeah. Now, what you guys do, you know, a lot of what you're doing is, is helping other companies grow, you know, as part of your mentorship program and, and part of what else you guys do. So let me ask you this. Well, you, you do a lot of marketing along the way, too. And one of the things that I think is interesting is how you're not a fan of sales funnels. Now, I know you're, you're obviously a fan of email marketing. I've, you know, I've looked at your blog and stuff, and I know, you know, even as part of your incubation phase, you have, like, content marketing templates and email marketing tech campaigns, things like that. So what is it about sales funnels? that people listening should be on the alert of or aware of because you're one of the only people I've ever said that, hey, you got to be aware. There's things you need to know and to throw out warning signs. So what are some of those warning signs that people should know about creating and using sales funnels? Well, I don't hate them. I mean, I, I wrote an article once called F Your Funnel that got a lot of attention, but the bottom line is like a, a sales funnel where you're generating cold leads and traffic through something like Facebook, it should really be about step eight in your marketing plan. And typically what happens is that you're skipping over or even sacrificing better leads who are closer to you, who fit perfectly into your target audience. If your first thought when it comes to marketing is Facebook ads or, you know, lead magnets, you know, we use lead magnets pretty often at 2Brain. I just published a 300 page ebook yesterday that people could download for free. But where most of our sales and conversions really come from is a one-on-one -on -one conversation with people. And so we tell people to invert their funnel. We say that first you need to know who your best clients are and then ask them what they want. And then the next step is the people closest to those best clients, how can you help them? So for example, in the fitness industry, that might be you come to my gym, Ty, and I say, hey, I know that you play pickup basketball at midnight with a bunch of guys. You know, you're all around 35 years old. Anybody got any aches and pains? Yeah, everybody's got a few. Well, why don't we bring them into the gym and, and I'll give you some stretches to do before the next basketball game. So that is going to link me with people from your age group, people from your financial demographic, probably. It's more people like you. And if you're my C client, that's exactly the kind of person I want. Hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to be said about that. I think that you have to actively rule out the customers you don't want like you said, to focus more time on, on your perfect customer, the, the one that you really do want. Yeah, that's a Mike McAllowitz concept from The Pumpkin Plan. I'm a huge fan of that book and Mike. And so if you start there, it gives you a really clear picture of what do your clients want. So for example, you know, I own a couple of CrossFit gyms and I thought for years that what people wanted was the most hardcore workouts that I could throw at them. You know, I thought they wanted to throw up in the garbage can and get – CrossFit tattooed on their arm, you know, and they don't, they don't want any of that stuff. So when I finally figured out who my best clients were and took them for coffee and asked them the important questions, what they told me were things like, when I come to your gym, I don't have to think. When I come to your gym, I leave happier than when I got there every day. You know, when I come to your gym, somebody always says you're doing it well or you're doing it right. And that's the only place in my life I get that. So our entire brand shifted that way. And then, of course, we started getting clients who aligned with that brand message because our best clients started bringing their friends in, you know? Sure. Um, when my brand didn't really align, when my best clients were just kind of like making exceptions to accommodate CrossFit into their lives, they didn't want to bring their friends. They didn't want to bring their wives. They didn't want to bring their aunts and uncles. As soon as I changed my branding position, they started bringing those people in. And then as soon as I went back to having conversations with them, instead of marketing on Facebook, we started getting more of those perfect people who were a great match for the gym. 
And then, you know, where most business owners are really missing out too is they're probably surrounded by an audience who is paying attention but not paying them money yet. So these are people who, you know, they've seen your signs, they've seen your ads, they've heard about you from a friend, they've been on your website, maybe they've been on your Facebook page, maybe they've been to your front door and just didn't come in. And it's those people who need to hear a stickier story about your brand, but you know, they're only one really good sentence away from converting, signing up. So to me, it makes sense to work on, on those audiences first. And there's four or five different unique groups in there. Then to go straight into like a sales funnel where you're pumping cold leads and trying to filter, filter, filter through. Sure. Makes sense. Now, when you talk about affinity marketing, what is it that you're mm -hmm. referencing? So affinity is, you know, your emotional connection with a client. So I want to start with people with whom I have the tightest emotional connection, and that's those seed clients. Then I want to look at who they influence, who they have their strongest affinity with. And so that's going to be first the people they live with. So Ty, I would say to you, you know, your spouse doesn't come to the gym. Why not? And have that conversation. And then I would say, let's talk about the people that you work with. How can my service help them? And then the Midnight Basketball League, and from there, it's going to be my email list and then audiences, you know, who are the other people in your industry who are like you and enjoy the same things. And then a few more steps before we start getting into Facebook and stuff like that. Sure. That's interesting. Now, the other part is you really mentioned is more of the relationship type marketing, right? I mean, yeah. you know, dealing face to face and building relationships. And, and that's really what you found in your experience, the best way to build the clients that you want to get versus just build a, an average prospect or client base. Yeah. I mean, if I look at, I think the last six or eight people who came to my gym or who showed up for the workshop, two thirds of them, I probably coached their kids in hockey. You know, so why did they come to the gym? Did they do extensive research on what is CrossFit and is that the best thing for me for weight loss? Or did they just say, Chris is a nice guy and I trust him? So a lot of business owners could really do better by taking the hour, two hours that they're behind a screen and walking up and down their street with coffee in their hand, handing it out. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like you're saying there's a world for both. You know, absolutely. Because the other you're referring to is content marketing. You're referring to ebooks. You're referring to you know some kind of limited email campaign on those type of aspects. So that, is that what you really are, are kind of leading to? Is both are work well? You've got to build the relationships face to face, target the ones that you really want, but then still have a content marketing strategy as well, where people can get guides and get emails, etc. Yeah, absolutely. So you do need both. Absolutely, you, you need to be putting more people in to your funnel or whatever you want to call it. And so maybe two to three times a year, you want to do something that puts your name in front of a brand new audience. But where most service industry owners are really missing the boat is that once people are in that funnel, they don't spend any time nurturing them or enough time nurturing them or going out to meet them. So, you know, if six people from my kids hockey team signed up at the gym in the last month, I guarantee they've all heard about Catalyst before. Some of them might've been on the email list. Half of them would have been on the Facebook page, but they were taking no action until I met them face to face, shook their hand, did something for them and invited them in. Now, what about, you know, in, in being in the gym industry and you, you have to be the foremost expert on this because, you know, one of the things I've heard about being in the gym industry is the turnover is really high. So what are some strategies you found and what you guys do to not just get the perfect customer that you want to have, but with retention to be able to retain those customers long term? Yeah, so we, we heavily leverage the power of novelty and the power of moments. If you haven't read Chip and, he Chip and Dan Heath's new book, Power of Moments, it's a fantastic one. But instead of forcing people into long-term contracts, which is what a lot of my competitors in, in town do, we've always focused on training our clients' brains to belong with us. So we want to reinforce things like the tribe, and we refer to our clients as the family. But we also make sure that we call them when they do something for the first time. You know, so maybe somebody got their first pull up today. Well, they're going to get a phone call on Friday. In our quarterly meetings where we're doing goal reviews, the client is going to have their progress measured. And then we're going to, again, have them view what life could be like three months from now if they're working out and if they're not working out and work backward from there, just like we did with our staff. Hmm. So I think 
the only thing that's that's stronger than a really good donut is a really sticky story. And if I can put the client into a, a state where they're visualizing themselves as the hero of the story and I'm the guide, then there's a great chance that they're going to stay till the end. Yeah, and I've seen you on your blog refer to that I think as hero's journey. And it's really interesting yeah. when I read that blog post because it talks about how really almost all stories, and you refer to Disney, really follow that same timeline. So it's, give me an idea. What are you talking about when you refer to hero's journey? And then how, are you, how have you found a way to actually embed that and use it within a business? Yeah, the hero's journey is a concept that was outlined by Joseph Campbell 100 years ago. And it's basically every sticky story in our culture follows the same pattern. There's a call to adventure. So the hero is having an okay life or an average life or whatever, and something calls them to take a drastic step that they don't really want to take. You know, Luke Skywalker is called to join the Jedi, and he doesn't think he's ready because he's too young, okay? And then the next step is that there is a mentor or a guide who comes along and prods the hero through the tough stuff. So, you know, Yoda. And you can go through this with any Disney movie. They have some adventures of increasing difficulty. Eventually, there's this big moment of self-discovery, and the hero discovers that what was really holding him back or stopping him from overcoming this thing was within. It wasn't this evil being. It was their own confidence in themselves, for example. Then there's a journey back home. There's a big celebration and the end. That's a really loose outline, and there are really about 20 parts to a story. But if we understand it, like our cultural traditions were mostly adopted because of, you know, word of mouth stories, then we can see like the natural progression that we have to have a client go through in our business. So in a gym industry, a person is called to adventure. They don't want to join a gym. They, you know, they don't want to be fat. They don't want to have to lose weight, but they do. And my job is to be the guide. So if I say, hey, it's free trial day at Catalyst, I'm not being the guide. I'm just saying, you know, there's the road. It's my job to meet with them first off and decide whether we're going to be a good fit, then to explain to them the first few steps on the journey, and then reinforce their decisions every time they take a step. It's to open up gaps in knowledge and then help them close the gap, have success immediately, right away. They have to feel like they've won something. And then ultimately give them a, a vision of what success is going to look like. You know, what is the mission here? And if we can do that and then break the steps down into a really small, you know, a trail of breadcrumbs, we can keep them around longer. You know, our average retention rate, and we don't have any contracts in my gym, in, at its best was 87% year over year. You know, very few people ever left that gym. Counting, people who moved away, uh, you know, people who broke their leg at work. All that stuff it can be overcome, mostly by harnessing the power of a good story. Wow. Yeah, and that's something I lack that I wish I could get better on because I think you're right. I mean, the key to a lot of it, even marketing alone, is just really your ability to tell a really good story. And that's what I found. I mean, if anybody buys Two Brain Business, my first book, what they're going to find is that like the editing is not perfect. There's some formatting problems. The first version didn't have page numbers. You know, there's like a section two, but no section one, on and on and on. But it's the best-selling fitness business book of all time because it's a great story. I thought I knew a lot about business. I didn't know anything about business. I almost went bankrupt. You know, I had this very clear turning point. I found a mentor, the guide, and we had these adventures. And then eventually I came to kind of a different level and started having these other adventures. And so, you know, Two Brain is as popular as it is because of the stories that we tell. Our clients are successful because of the stories they tell their audience. Yeah, and that's so very true. Not only is it, you know, it, it just it's kind of the root of business. I mean, you know, the, it, a company that itself has a good story, you know, is already leaps and bounds on, on its way to success above company that just doesn't have a story or the story of the owner that founded the business. Yeah, I mean, does anybody know – if Tom's shoes were good quality, maybe they were, but he has an amazing story, right? Yeah, so true. Well, what about systems? You know, when we talk about growing a business, another one of the things I've seen you talk about is systems. What type of systems do you think are really essential for a business to be able to succeed at a high level? 
Well, in, in general terms, what we do is we start with Michael Gerber's exercise from the E-Myth, Roles and Tasks. And we do that for every single business we work with, gym owner, small engine mechanic, attorney. We break down all the hats that are worn in the business. And then we say, what are the tasks associated with each? And then we identify what's the lowest value use of that professional's time. And then we put somebody else in that role. And the exercise is really how comfortable are you walking away from one tiny piece of your business that really doesn't matter all that much. And the process to do that usually means that the owner has to build a strong system around it. So for example, I run a barber shop, and the lowest value role on my list is cleaning the floors. Well, cleaning the floors is pretty important in a barber shop, but that doesn't mean I have to do it. I could be spending that time you know, calling all my old clients and saying, hey, you need a haircut. So I'm going to hire somebody else to do it. So the system that I need to build is how clean do I want this floor? So I'm going to start with a checklist. Then I'm going to start with probably a picture of the floor when it's at its cleanest and maybe a video, whatever. Then I can take my hand off that role and I can start working on higher value roles. So the next highest value role is sharpening the scissors. Okay, how can I move that to someone else? And this is basically the process of getting the perfect day is, can you replace yourself with systems? Can you automate? Can you codify? Can you optimize? And then it's having a mentor who can ask you or who can show you like, here's the gold standard. Can you get to this level? You know, the gold standard in the barber industry might be quarter million dollars net per year as an owner operator cutting hair two hours a day. And so once you've got that vision, you can work backward and say, what systems do I need to get there? I like that. Start with the end go goal in mind and then work yeah. backwards to structure the systems you need to get there. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. What are some of the other strategies you have for somebody that's looking to really, you know, grow their business? I mean, like, you know, 10x kind of growth that you found in the mentorship game really make the biggest impact quickly for business owners to be able to do that, to grow at that kind of level. Partnerships are a huge one. Establishing authority is another huge one. I mean, if we're talking about a financial advisor in my town, as a financial advisor, you need to establish yourself as an authority because people are scared to touch their money. They're scared to talk about their money. They're scared to talk about how much they make. They're scared to save it because they're scared to lose it. People don't care about money until they need it, and then that's all they care about. Sure. So if I'm a financial advisor in town, the first thing that I would be doing is holding seminars in places where my target audience hangs out. So I might host a seminar for a dental office. I might host a seminar at a gym. I mean, broke people don't do CrossFit. You know, so I should host a seminar at a CrossFit gym. I might host a free seminar for people who bought cars or use this insurance agency or you know, bought pets at this store. Wherever I know my target audience is, I want to establish my authority there. I also want to make sure that I'm creating a lot of evergreen content, like that I'm on YouTube. You know, Vaynerchuk, what did he do in day one? He shot videos about how to match wine with what you're eating for dinner, right? And, and it's this kind of stuff that, that really establishes like that you're the number one person in town. The other thing too, I think is you really need as a service professional to make sure that you're replaceable, to not be the icon in your own business. If you're in an accounting office, and you have four accountants working for you, but every big client wants to talk to you directly, you're never going to get free of that job. So you have to replace yourself in the business by putting those other people to the forefront, putting their faces on your website, their faces on Facebook, having them call your clients and establish them as the authority too. And then mentor them in their own careers and eventually make your staff partners in the business. That doesn't literally mean an ownership stake. It means sharing the burden of responsibility and the benefits of success. So as we get ready to wrap up, Chris, let me ask you this. I mean, we've talked a lot about mentorship. It's what you do, you know, throughout the call today. You know, what are some of the parting thoughts on things that people should do to be able to either start considering a mentor in their business? Actually, let me do this. Let me ask you okay. this. Give me an example of where you've really seen a mentor outside of your life really have an impact on taking somebody to the next level. Yeah. I, I mean, mentors have all different shapes and sizes. I have a mentor who I pay because I want him to be remote enough for my business 
that he can be objective. But I also have a mentor like my father-in-law. You know, when I got married, I said, I'm going to take six months off and build a house. And he said, what do you know about building houses? And I said, well, I, I got this book and I got this hammer and I'm pretty good at learning stuff. And he said, dummy, you would be better to go to work, do what you know, and hire somebody else to build this house. And that's what we did. And it hasn't fallen down. In a paid context, I need somebody who can say, look, it doesn't matter how many people told you they loved you, you know, because of your amazing service this month. It doesn't matter how many thank you cards you got. It doesn't matter how clean your floors are. Did you make this goal or did you not? And that's been amazing. In our practice, you know, I, I got an email last week that said the incubator saved my business and probably my marriage. These are the kind of real rewards that we get is, you know, as an entrepreneur, there's the business places stress on everything, right. on your on your time, on your wallet, and on your family. And the sooner you can relieve that stress, the sooner all those things can grow. So that's the kind of external benefit that we try to look for all the time. Chris, as we get ready to wrap up, what's your best general <clears throat> overall advice for other entrepreneurs trying to break through and, and find the kind of success that you found? I think they should look for a mentor that they could talk to in person instead of just a role model. You know, Seth Godin's my role model. I've never spoken to him. He's not my mentor. So I want somebody... I want somebody who can hold me accountable from afar. I want somebody that I'm going to meet with in person a few times a year and that I'm going to pay a lot of money to, frankly. You know, our practice, we charge way too little. We should be charging about $50,000 a year. Someday we might. But if you're in a business, number one, I would look for supportive peers. Find other people, even online, who are in the exact same position you are. That's super important because they'll push you from behind. And you also need a, a role model with a personal connection like a mentor to pull you from the front. Chris, where can everybody go to learn more information about you, about Two Brain, and also about mentorship and what it can do for them? We publish a lot of content, twobrainbusiness.com, which is really our gym-specific site. In fact, we publish so often that last week when somebody asked, how often do you publish, I posted the question to my editor. And um, she stripped all of our blog posts and created a book that was 380 pages from one year. Um, wow. So there's a lot of stuff there. And then twobrain.com is where we publish information that's more generally applicable to the service industry. So everybody, make sure that you check out both twobrainbusiness.com. And then you said the other one's twobrain.com, right? Yeah. Okay, so twobrain.com. I'll put both of those in the show resources page. And I'm also going to put a link to Chris's social media links on there. And I'm also going to put a link to your book on there as well. Look, I really Thanks. recommend everybody goes to twobrainbusiness.com. I haven't been to twobrain.com, but I can tell you on twobrainbusiness.com, just going through the site, just going through the blog, um, I was blown away at how many awesome concepts were there and how much cool stuff I learned, even though I'm not a gym owner. Even on twobrainbusiness.com in the blog and on the site, there's a lot of really, really, really good information. So make sure you check out those two links and make sure – that you check out mentorship. Make sure you go there to learn more. I can tell you I use a mentor. I can tell you that anyone that I know in my circle that owns a successful business, they all have coaches. They all have mentors as well. This is something even from the startup phase that you really should be considering. And this is why I wanted to bring in literally the foremost expert on this topic. So, Chris, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Ty. I don't, You're flattering. I don't say that That's lightly, great. man. I did research. You're the guy. Yeah. You're the top guy guy out there on this so i, I really appreciate it and i appreciate you coming on man thank you so much for taking the time out uh, to, to speak to our listeners today it really means a lot my pleasure take right, care so, so same to you everybody check out twobrainbusiness.com also make sure you check out twobrain.com thank you all very much for taking the time to tune in today have a great day everybody thank you so much you've been listening to the business credit and financing show with your host ty crandall Watch for our next episode to get even more insight on financing and growing your business. And don't forget to check us out online at creditsuite.com for even more business growth strategies.